I'm going to ask you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And this is 10,005. That's the page number if you use one of the Pew Bibles, and you're always welcome to use those. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and one verse, and you saw this in the video at the very end, verse 18. Would you stand with me as we honor the reading of God's inspired and infallible word together? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. And the Bible says, Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in what? Everything. Give thanks in everything. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you. I love the story about the two men that were walking across a field one day, and there was an angry bull that came out after them and began to chase them and pursue them. And that bull was making up a lot of ground. He was getting closer and closer and closer. And as these men ran, they knew they were losing ground. And one of the guys said, Hey, John, you need to pray because this bull's catching up to us. And John said, Well, I've never prayed out in public before. I'm not sure I could do that. And the guy said, You'd better pray because these bulls are getting closer and closer and closer. And John said, Then I'll pray the prayer that my father taught me to pray. And he said this, O oh Lord, for what we're about to receive, we are truly thankful. <laughs> well, sometimes it's really hard to be thankful in circumstances that we face in life. During this time of the year leading up to Thanksgiving on this, kind, this coming Thursday, there are a lot of people who encourage us to develop and cultivate within us an attitude of gratitude. And that means that we need to live a life that's filled consistently with an attitude of thankfulness all year long. Not just one day out of the year in November on a Thursday, but all year long, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, and month out. Now, I call this attitude of gratitude thankitude. Thankitude. It's a consistent, constant inner attitude of thankfulness. And I want you to say that word with, with me this morning. Thankitude. Say it with me. All right, here we go. Thankitude. All right, say it again. Thankitude. Now you got it. Thankitude, an attitude of gratitude. Now, I think that's the attitude that Paul was trying to convey and to instill in the hearts and minds of the Thessalonians in the first century world. He said, give thanks in everything that you go through. Have a constant, consistent attitude of thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. I would call that thankitude. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. Now, here's the question. Number one, is it even possible for the Apostle Paul and people in the first century world, knowing what kind of world they lived in with Rome and the tyranny of Rome and all the obstacles they faced with the growing church in that generation, was it even possible for them to really give thanks in everything? And what about us? Alive in the 21st century, with all the things that are going on, the threats against Israel and the bombing that's taking place in the Middle East and all the economy situation that we're facing in this country and all the other issues that are on the table, is there any way for us truly to have a thankitude attitude in life? And if so, here's another question, why is it important? Well, this morning I want us to look at God's Word and see what He tells us about thankitude, how important it is, and how to cultivate that in your life and in my life. I'm thankful for Thursday being a day of thanksgiving, but I really believe that you and I need to be thankful every single day in our life. That can change our perspective. It can change the way we look at life, the way we go through problems and difficulties, our sense of victory as we go through this life. So thankitude is the subject on the table this morning. Let me share with you three things. First of all, thankitude makes us a contented person. A contented person. Do you think that most people in our nation today, most people in our culture, do you really think that they are content in their heart and in their life? I don't know of any statistics that really affirm this, but my guess is probably not. It seems like we live in a culture where people are wanting more and more and more. They're wanting to have more possessions and more material goods. They're wanting more money. They're wanting a larger 401K or even a 401K that survived all the financial crisis that we've been through. And they're anxious for more and more and more. I believe so many people are caught up in that vicious circle of things. Now, that's the attitude, this idea of being discontent with what we have that sometimes affects we men. Sometimes we go out to the garage and we open the door, and there sits a car, perfectly good car. It's three or four years old, but somehow as guys, we think to ourselves, you know, I think I'd like to have a, a new car. 
a newer car that's sleeker and faster and more horsepower. I think I need a car like that. Lord, what about that? I, I think I need a car like that. I need a new vehicle. I need something flashy and shiny. And usually when you get about 40 to 50 years old, guys, this really hits home, right? And you think, man, I need a new car. Never mind the fact that we can only drive 55, but this thing can go 0 to 150 on the interstate. What good is all that speed when you can only drive 55 miles per hour? Did you hear about the guy? And he told his wife, here's what I want for Christmas. I want something that can go from 0 to 235 in 2.5 seconds. You know what she got him? She got him a set of bathroom scales. <laughs> 0 to 235. Now that'll work for you. And that'll solve that midlife crisis thing that's going on in a lot of people's lives. But this is the attitude. I need more. I need faster. I need sleeker. I need flashier. I need something more than I have. This is also the attitude of discontent that sometimes ladies have. They open the closet door, and I mean the racks are sagging with all of the clothes that they've got. They've got pants, and they've got suits, and they've got blouses, and they've got dresses, and they've got skirts, and they've got all this thing, and probably about two million pairs of shoes. Do you know what I'm talking about, guys? And all that stuff is in that closet, and then they look at their wares that are hanging up there, and they say, I have nothing to what? Wear. I have nothing to wear. You've heard that, too. And what I've learned as a husband is this. Being interpreted, that means I have nothing new to wear. I need something brand new. All the stuff I've got, it's not adequate. I need something new for this event or that event. This is also the attitude that sometimes young people and children manifest. They go into their room and they've got all the latest gadgets and computers and computer games and giant screen televisions and telephones and everything else that we can imagine. And what do they say? There's nothing to do. There's nothing to do. It's the attitude of being discontent. And that's a major problem. As a matter of fact, I really believe that this idea of discontentment is probably the root cause of a lot of the problems that you and I face in life. In fact, one pastor called it a disease that eats away at the very fabric of our life, who we are and the way we look at things, our perspective on life. And I think he's probably right when he says that. It's this attitude of being discontent that probably is at the root of a lot of divorces that take place in our society today. And it seems like every day we're reading about people getting divorced and people getting separated, eventually being divorced. And that's a tragic heartbreak. And some of you that have been through that, my heart goes out to you. God loves you and God can give you a new relationship with new love. But there's always seemingly that wound that's there from a previous relationship. But I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful there's an answer for discontentment. I'll deal with that in just a moment. But it's discontentment sometimes that gives rise to this whole problem of divorce. Because one of the spouses says, well, you know, I think I can do a whole lot better. And really, wouldn't it be exciting if I had somebody brand new in my life? If I brought somebody else into my life and we were intimate together, wouldn't that be a great thing? That would be so exciting and so thrilling. And I just deserve, I just need, I just want somebody else in my life. And many people think like that. Well, how does that usually work out? Well, let's ask David Petraeus. How do you think it's going to work out for him? And what do you think about John Edwards, the former senator? How did it work out for him? And what about Jimmy Swaggart or Jim Baker from the past? How did it work out for those guys? I want to tell you, usually when we're dealing with divorce, somewhere in the relationship, there's discontentment. Somebody's discontent with the relationship, with the marriage, with the other person, and they begin to seek out somebody new for their life. And I believe this is a problem that's a root problem in divorce. This is also a root problem with increasing debt. I was reading the other day that the average American citizen owes $8,000 on their credit card. Some a whole lot more than that, some less than that, but the average is $8,000 per credit card, and usually people have more than one. I've got about four in my wallet that I carry with me. I don't use all of them, thank the Lord, but they're there if I need them, and some people have all those credit cards they carry maxed out. Now, why is that? Well, generally, it's a problem of discontentment. They're saying, I need more, I need this, I don't have the money for it. But I can walk into a store and say, charge, just like the Calvary in the old days, charge. And immediately, 
I can take this thing home with me right now. Don't worry about it. I'll pay it off later. But the problem is all these charges begin to accrue. And before you know it, you can be underwater with tremendous debt on credit cards. If you've got credit cards, please be careful with them. Dave Ramsey says this, the first month you can't pay it off in its entirety, cut it up, get rid of it. Do some plastic surgery and cut the plastic in half and get rid of the credit card. And we need to abide by that, but one of the problems with credit and credit cards is a feeling of discontentment. Will Rogers lived a long time ago and he lived before the days of credit cards and some of the students are saying, Will who? Well, you can look it up on Google. But Will Rogers was a comedian and a speaker who traveled all over the country and all over the world. And on one occasion, Will Rogers said this. He said people in his generation were spending money they didn't have to buy things they didn't need to impress people they didn't even like. You know, I think we're doing that. We're spending money we don't have to buy things we really don't need to impress people we don't even like in the first place. That's the symptoms of what's taking place in our culture, and a lot of it is due to discontentment. Well, what's the cure for discontentment? I believe it's very simple. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, the Apostle Paul writes about it. Here's what he says, For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. King James says, In whatever state I am, I have learned therewith to be content. Now that word contentment that's used there in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 is also used in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8, it is translated as sufficiency. Very same Greek word in Timothy, it's translated as contentment. Our Thessalonians is translated as contentment, but also it's translated in Corinthians as sufficiency. Here's the key to everything. Whatever our circumstances in life, we can be content because we have a source supernaturally for our sufficiency. And that supernatural source of our sufficiency is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He provides everything we really need in life. He takes care of us the way that he should and the way only he can. In his omniscience, his omnipotence, he's the only one that can really be our source of sufficiency. And so our sufficiency is not in our banking account. That can change by the day. It's not in the stock market. That can also change by the day. It's not in world events. Those change by the hour. But our sufficiency is in Jesus Christ, the unchangeable Son of God. That's what gives us confidence to face living, and also that brings a sense of contentment and peace into our heart. Now, don't get the wrong idea about this conception of of contentment. Don't get the wrong impression about that. It doesn't mean resignation. It doesn't mean that I resign myself. Well, I've got this much and I'll probably never have any more than that. And so I'm just going to resign myself. And even though I don't like it, I don't enjoy it. I'm just going to go through life. This is all I've got. Poor me, poor me. That's not the attitude of real contentment. Neither is the attitude of a lack of ambition. A lot of people would say, well, how can you have ambition and be content with where you are? Well, you can do that. I think the Apostle Paul was a man with ambition. We know for one thing he wanted to get to Rome and preach the gospel to the Gentiles there and share the word of God with the Romans. That was a driving force in his life. That was a passion in his heart. He wanted to go there and preach the gospel. He was a man of ambition. And yet he said, I have contentment. He was content where he was in the circumstance that he was at that particular time even though he still had ambitions for the future. Here's the way I look at contentment. I believe I can be contented right now regardless of circumstances before I achieve anything else, before I attain anything else, and before I accomplish anything else because Jesus Christ is sufficient for me. He will meet my needs. He will take care of me. And knowing that ought to give me a sense of contentment that God will provide for me in the future just as he's provided in the past. And I can trust him explicitly to do that. And that brings a sense of contentment. And I really believe that Christians should have that sense of contentment. And we need to be content. And if we're thankful for what we've already got, and we've got that thankitude in our life, then indeed we can be a contented person. Here's the second thing I want you to notice. Not only are contented people, the people that have this thankitude, but also people who have thankitude are cheerful people. 
They're contented people, but they're also cheerful people. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul told the believers, In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you. Now, what was going on in the church in Thessalonica in the first century? Well, for one thing, we know they were kind of mixed up about the rapture of the church. They had heard the apostle Paul come and preach. Can you imagine the privilege of hearing him preach? And Paul preached about the rapture, that one day Jesus would come back again, and the dead in Christ would rise first, and those who were alive in that generation would be caught up without ever experiencing death, and they'd meet the Lord in the air. And Paul said, so shall we all ever be with the Lord, comfort one another with these words. And they heard the way Paul preached that so passionately. And they began to think, well, the Lord's coming back tomorrow or maybe sooner. And they thought his coming was immediate, immediate. And they became a little disappointed because time went on and Jesus didn't come back and more time passed and Jesus didn't come back and more time passed and Jesus didn't come back. And some of the people in the older generation began to die off. And they began to think, wait a minute, what's wrong with this picture? Jesus was supposed to come back again. And these people weren't supposed to die. They were supposed to meet the Lord in the air. And they became confused about the rapture and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here was another way they were confused. They began to think, you know, if the Lord's coming back soon, and we believe that he is, if he's coming back that soon, then we ought to quit our jobs and just wait for the Lord to come back again. And so they quit their jobs, and they just sat back and waited for Jesus to come. I want to tell you that is not the will of God. In fact, Jesus said, occupy till I come. Now, when Jesus used the word occupy, he wasn't talking about buying a pup tent and parking yourself on public property somewhere. That's not the occupy he was talking about. He was saying, occupy, serve, invest, keep on working for the kingdom, keep on going for the glory of God right up until the moment the trumpet sounds and the eastern sky splits. Keep on working. But these people had quit work, many of them. And because of that, they were in financial difficulty. And they were depressed and they were downtrodden. And Paul writes to them in 1 Thessalonians and in 2 Thessalonians. And he says, hey, Thessalonians, this is no way for the people of God to be moping around, complaining because they're in financial straits and because they've been disappointed because Jesus hasn't come back yet. You need to have a more positive attitude. So come on and be thankful in everything that you're going through in life. Be thankful in everything for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now the problem with this verse, be thankful in everything, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, is that sometimes we read it incorrectly. And sometimes we glance at it and we think, well, what's Paul really saying here? And what's God saying through Paul? Well, maybe he's saying this, be thankful for everything. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Is that what Paul said, be thankful for? No, he didn't really say that, but sometimes we read that into it. Can I be totally honest with you today? There are some things in life that I really can't be thankful for. I can't be thankful for them when I get a phone call from one of our precious church members and they tell me, Pastor, I went to the doctor, we had some tests made, and the results came back and I've been diagnosed with cancer. I can't be thankful for the cancer. I can be thankful for their faith. I can be faithful for the Lord being in their life, but I really can't be thankful for the cancer. When somebody calls and they say, Pastor, so-and-so had a heart attack. I can't be thankful for that heart attack. I can't be thankful for those kinds of things. It's not even normal to be thankful for those kind of negative experiences and trials and battles and difficulties and illnesses that many of us walk through in life. I heard about a little boy. He's four or five years old. He was gathered with his family on Thanksgiving Day, and they were sharing the meal together. And one of the leaders of the group, one of the adults, said, why don't we let him pray, the four or five-year-old, and have the blessing for the food today? And this little boy said, okay, and he began to pray. And he prayed for everybody around the table, all the family that was assembled there. Thank you for Grandpa, and thank you for Grandma, and thank you for Mom and Dad, thank you for brother and sister and aunt and uncle, thank you for the dog and the parakeet, and thank you for everybody in the family. He named them all. And then he went into the food, and he began to pray for every item on the table. Thank you, Lord, for the turkey. Thank you for the dressing. Thank you for the fruit salad. Thank you, Lord, for the cranberry sauce. Lord, thank you for the tea. Thank you for the coffee. Thank you for the water. Thank you for the dessert. Going down the list, one thing after another. 
And then all of a sudden, he just stopped. He didn't say amen. He just stopped. And everybody was kind of looking around because it was kind of uneasy. He just quit praying right in the middle of his prayer. And then he looked up at his mom, and he said this. If I thank God for the broccoli, won't God know that I'm lying? <laughs> amen? amen? There are some things in life that you and I really can't be thankful for. But at the same time, you and I can be thankful in those things as we go through those things, not for them, but in them. And that's why Paul uses that phraseology. And he says, be thankful in everything, not for it, but in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, why can we be thankful in everything, even if we're not thankful for everything? Well, first of all, we can be thankful in everything because it could be worse. I mean, it really could. It could be worse. I've got to the point in my life, I never asked this question, what else could happen? Because the Lord's taught me a few times, a lot can happen, right? So I never say that anymore. What in the world could happen? What else could take place? I just don't say that anymore because I know where that can go. But you and I can be thankful in everything, thank God, because it's not any worse. I love the story about the old preacher and he was well known for having a positive attitude. He always saw the light at the end of the tunnel. He always saw the silver lining behind every cloud. And his church family was amazed by that, that this guy could be so positive no matter what was said or what took place or what happened in his life or in the community. And one night, it was incredibly bad weather. I mean, it was stormy. It was dark. Clouds were hanging low. Rain was coming down by the bucketful. Lightning was striking across the sky. Thunder was rolling. And it was a horrible night. And they said, I wonder what the pastor's going to be thankful for tonight. How can he see anything good in this huge storm and this flooding that's taking place? What in the world can he be thankful for? And that night, they packed out the church. Now, you can tell they weren't Baptists because they came even though it rained. Amen? They were there in the house of the Lord. It's always amazed me about Baptists. We insist on baptism by immersion, fully dunked under the water, put them under to the bubble. We believe in that. But the least little bit of rain, and I can't go out. i got to stay home. I can't go to church. But these people came out. They weren't Baptist, apparently, but they came just to see what their pastor would say. And he stood behind the pulpit that evening, and he said, Dear God, thank you that every night is not like this night. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Can you thank the Lord that every day is not like this day? That every week is not like this week? I know some of you have been through a lot of circumstances that have been very hard over the past year. Maybe it's been financial or relational or emotional, or maybe you've lost a job even, or maybe there's some other tragedy that's taken place health-wise in your life, or a loved one has gone on to be with the Lord, and it's been a very difficult year. Aren't you glad every year is not like that? It could be worse. That's why you and I can be thankful in everything, even though we're not thankful for everything. We can also be thankful in everything because we're not going through it alone. Guess who's with us every step of the way? His name is Jesus. He's always there. He'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. He's always right there. We can also be thankful because whatever we're going through is temporary. One pastor said this, my favorite passage in all the Bible is this one where the Bible says, and it came to pass. And he said, you know, it came to pass. It didn't come to stay. It's only temporary. And that's why suicide is not a good option. That's a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And all of your problems and all of my problems are temporary. Even if they last us for the rest of our life, they're still temporary. Because when Jesus comes back in the rapture, or we die and we go to be with the Lord in His presence, we leave all those problems behind. And compared to eternity, they're only temporary. We also have the assurance of Romans 8, 28 that Mitch quoted earlier, that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are called according to His purpose. And so today, no matter what you and I are going through, we can be thankful in those things even though we're not thankful for them. Things could be a whole lot worse. A few years ago, there was a Charlie Brown cartoon and it showed Snoopy outside with his doghouse, and he had a great big old dog bowl filled with dry dog food. Well, just beyond Snoopy was the house, and it was Thanksgiving, 
And all the children and all the family was gathered around the table and they had turkey and dressing and all the fixings and everything there and they were laughing and they were joyful and they were happy. They were all inside the house and Snoopy was grumbling and complaining and he was griping in all those little scenes that were set up in that cartoon. But then when it came to the last scene, Snoopy said this, you know, it could be worse. I could be the turkey. (laughs) Amen. So even if you don't have much else to be thankful for on this Thanksgiving, just be glad you're not a butterball. Amen. (laughs) Praise the Lord for that. There's at least one thing on your Thanksgiving list today, and we give him glory for that. Let me share with you one last thing. Thankitude makes us content. It makes us cheerful with a positive outlook, but also it makes us a caring person. Now, unthankful people aren't usually very generous. But you show me somebody who's overwhelmed with the blessings of God in their life and their hearts overflow with thankitude, that attitude of thanksgiving, and they'll be the most caring, giving, sharing people that you'll ever meet every single time. There's something about a thankful person that motivates them to share and to give with others so that they too can be blessed. They don't want to keep that blessing to themselves. They just want to share it. There's something about a thankful attitude that leads to that kind of perspective in life. Now, there are many examples of this thankful attitude manifesting itself in sharing and caring and giving all through the Bible. But as in all things, the greatest example is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Let me ask you this this morning. Do you think that Jesus Christ was thankful when he was upon the earth? Do you think that he exhibited an attitude of thanksgiving, that he had thankitude in his heart? I really believe that he did. In fact, if you go to the upper room at the Last Supper, Jesus is there, and the Bible says he's instituting that meal that represents his broken body and his shed blood, and the Word of God says he took the bread and he gave what? Thanks. He was a few hours away from the most agonizing death in the history of mankind, He was going to die for the sins of the world, be separated from God the Father for the first time in all of time and eternity, and Jesus gave thanks. He was a grateful individual. But what about this? Do you think that Jesus was a generous person? Well, let's go to the cross. On either side, a thief is also being crucified. Now, we know that one rejected Jesus. We know that story. But the other one said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Did Jesus say, oh, no. You've sinned too badly. You've been convicted by a court of law. You've been crucified because you are guilty as charged. No, Jesus didn't say that. Did Jesus say, well, in order to be saved and to be with me in paradise today, you need to get off the cross and be baptized or do a certain amount of good works to earn your salvation? Did Jesus say that? No. Remember what Jesus said? Today you'll be with me where? In paradise. We call it heaven. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus Christ himself was a grateful person. He was thankful, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, but he was also a very, very generous person. I'm so grateful for my salvation, aren't you? I'm grateful that God so loved me that he sent his only begotten Son, that because I believe in him that I can be redeemed and be forever saved and be a part of his family. I'll never get over that no matter how long I live. And even in eternity, I'll be praising him for his salvation. I also am very grateful for another reason, another sacrifice that was made for me. You see, it was one year ago yesterday that I went through my kidney transplant process. I've been a type 1 diabetic for 44 years, insulin dependent. And after so many years, diabetes does take its toll. And it just happened that my kidney was affected by the diabetes over that longevity of time. And I was in end-stage renal failure. Many of you were here as a part of the church during that process, and you supported me and prayed for me, and I was able to keep on preaching at least most of the time. But I spent about four and a half hours per day, three days a week, hooked up to a dialysis machine to keep me alive, and that really wasn't exciting. And i got to be honest with you, I wasn't thankful for having end-stage renal failure. I really wasn't thankful for a dialysis machine and being hooked up to it. I wasn't thankful for that but here's what I learned I learned how to be thankful in that I learned that I could depend upon God that he would order my steps that he would guide me that he would meet the needs that he'd provide for me I learned how to be thankful in everything even if I couldn't be thankful 
before everything. Well, I'm so grateful as I look back on that entire period of time, the toughest chapter out of my life by far. I'm thankful for my family because my wife and my children stood with me. They prayed for me steadfastly. They were there. They didn't abandon me in the midst of my suffering, and I know that does happen sometimes. It's a lot of emotional turmoil for caregivers and family, and some of you are caregivers. You know how difficult that can be. Maybe you've been a caregiver in the past for a, a person that's not able to take care of themselves any longer, and that's very, very difficult. My family stood with me. This church family prayed, and I know you supported me during that time, and you brought food by and different things like that and cards of encouragement and calls, and that's deeply, deeply appreciated. What a blessing that was. I'm thankful that 10 or 12 people said, Pastor Buddy, we're willing to give a kidney for you. And you know, that was a humbling experience. To think that somebody would undergo the pain and the difficulty of surgery to give a kidney from their own body to me. That is overwhelming to me. Donna's experienced the same thing. She's been through that. It was absolutely amazing. I'll never, ever forget that sacrifice. My wife wanted to give me a kidney, but she only has one. And if she donated a kidney to me, she'd be a goner. And so we didn't want that to happen. My son and my daughter, they also went. They were tested. They were a perfect match, each one of them. But for whatever the reason, neither one could really have the surgery and donate a kidney. And it just seemed like every door closed. There was another guy from a sister church, and he had called me and told me that God had laid upon his heart. He was going to be the one. He was a perfect match. He was going to donate a kidney. And then he called back just a few weeks before and said, I've come down with a sickness, and I can't donate any longer. And it just seemed like every door closed. And to be honest with you, it was a little disappointing. And I began to wonder, will it ever happen? And then Karen Lenham said one night, Pastor Buddy, I need to talk to you. Now, when a church member says that to a pastor, I've got to tell you, sometimes we kind of put up the shields. Pastor Buddy, I need to speak to you. But she came, and Marcus came, and Sabrina came, and my wife was there, and we sat down in my office on a Wednesday night. I missed prayer meeting that night because we were meeting in my office. And Karen told me she'd been tested and gone through the screening process, and she was a perfect match. And that she was willing to give me a kidney so that I could live. And I want to tell you something. In that moment of time, I have never been so overwhelmed in all of my life. And I'll never forget that. I'll never forget the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. And I'll never forget the sacrifice that Karen Lanham made for me so that I can be alive today. Karen, I want you to come and share testimony. Well, this morning my daughter wasn't here <clears throat> I didn't cry she's already got me started you know it was a year ago yesterday and it's been kind of fast to, when you look back um, but even before a year ago about a year and a half a, ago um, I was driving down the road and I listened to a contemporary Christian radio station and a song by jo Josh Wilson was playing, and the words really struck me. And here's how some of the words said, I don't want to sit around and wait for someone else to do what God has called me to do myself. I don't want to live like I don't care. And this ignited a, my heart to begin praying that God would use me, that um, I wouldn't be complacent. I remember telling God that I don't want to be complacent. Use me. I don't want to be a churchy Christian with churchy, churchy answers. I want the power of God to change my life. My heart was fully open to him, and I had no idea of the things to come. Obviously, it was months later when things started to kind of turn around for me. i got to put my glasses on. <laughs> Sitting in church that Sunday when I thought I could have the very kidney Buddy needs, I didn't know it would change me too. I didn't know donating a kidney would change my heart. Many years ago, the kids and I were traveling out of town, and at this time, this is long before I came to Mount Harmony, we were driving a Ford Escort wagon. That was the car I owned at the time. They were smaller, of course. And as we were going up 
321 towards Hickory, there was a car in the right lane that we were beginning to pass that was just like my car that I was driving and it had three passengers in it. And as we were passing, I said, look kids, we're having an out of car experience. <laughs> and this past year has seemed like an out of body experience. Being the answer prayer, the vessel God would use, the prayer, prayer, and the prayee, if you will, all seems like an out of body experience. And looking back, I attribute that to the touch of the master's hand. There are two questions that were frequently asked to me um, as we got closer to um, going through the surgery and donating. And the first one was, are you scared? And I never was. And here's why. In 1 John 4, 15 and follows, it says, if any acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. And in verse 18, it says, there is no fear in love. You see, God gives you what you need to do his will. The second question I was asked a lot is, are you sure? And I never had any doubt, not even for a second. I, I, when I went to be tested, I decided then that if I was a match, that I was going through it, hook, line, and sinker, I wasn't going to back out. And it was his peace, the peace that passes all understanding, that was with me to help me to be sure of, of what I needed to do. I looked up the word testimony just to maybe help me give a, a different angle for giving my testimony today. And one line that really stuck out was, the truth of the matter is. Well, the truth of the matter is, God never gave me more than I could handle. There are no coincidences with God. There were many stories within this story that took place in my life as donating a kidney to Buddy. The truth of the matter is I have a greater understanding now of who God is. I have new confidence in a God who never leaves us or forsakes us. You know, being a single mom, I've, all, I've been a single mom forever. Now I'm a single mom all. <laughs> but I had trouble in trust, trusting my choices and trusting God. And in looking back, and having a new confidence in God through all this and seeing how Buddy struggled for so long, and yet he kept at it. He kept giving God the glory and putting it in his hands. And even though he wasn't thankful to be in that position, he still came out here Sunday after Sunday. And being that God used me, it also showed me that God never forsakes us or, you know, I have a new trust, a new level of understanding. I'm thankful for Sabrina and Marcus. Marcus is my stronghold. He was there with his sister in the waiting room keeping her calm or trying to. Sabrina has, made, has taught me to cry out loud, to not be ashamed to let tears flow from the outside. And you church family, you prayed for us a year ago, a year prior to me being the donor, you guys prayed for me. You prayed for my family, because if, if some of you will remember, we were concerned that a cadaver donor would not be a Christian. And so that was a concern. But all the prayers that were, that were prayed up by you, church, um, were for me, even though it wasn't, I didn't know it was for me. Um, there is a new level of worship that I have now because of a greater understanding of who God is. And just as a footnote, that Wednesday night um, when we went to talk to Buddy and tell him that I was a match, um, I mentioned earlier about, you know, God doesn't give us more than we can handle with him. He doesn't give us more than we can handle. My daughter looked across the room at, at Candy and said, all I know is anything happens to my mom, you're going to take care of me. Well, nothing happened to me, and I believe it's because 
Candy, you couldn't handle her. <laughs> that would be more than God, than you could handle. But I just want to say that, you know, I really don't feel worthy um, to be anybody special because it was all God's doing. It's all his master, touch of his master's hand. He was in charge from, from the get-go, and I just want to give him the praise and the glory. And I'm sure that's well over my a lot of time. Yes, I've heard all the jokes about uh, having a lady's kidney, and um, I can tell you that I do enjoy shopping a lot more than I used to, so praise the Lord, amen? There are benefits to everything, I guess, but I am eternally grateful to the Lord Jesus Christ for his sacrifice, but also to my family, to the church family, and to Karen. Thank you. Um, there's something about a thankful heart that just makes you generous, makes you care. And I believe we have a very caring church, a very gracious church. And I saw it firsthand. I've seen it many times in other people's lives. But when you're on the receiving end of it, it really stands out, guys. You're very special. You do a great job. And I'm so thankful God placed you in my life at a very strategic time when I needed you. I needed a broad base of support, and you guys were there. Thank you for that. Thank you. This morning, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, I want to tell you, you can receive him just like we've received Christ into our heart the same way, just by saying, Lord, I believe that Christ died for me. I'm a sinner and I need salvation. And I want to receive Jesus Christ into my heart today. We'd be glad to pray with you about that. Brother Richard, our pastor of evangelism is down front. He'll be more than happy to talk to you about salvation. If you'd like to join our church, I can tell you, we'll be thankful for you. We'll welcome you with open arms. And if you want to come, you're welcome to come this morning. But also one other thing, maybe you have somebody you're really grateful for today, and maybe they just, just happen to be here. I'm going to ask you to do something that we don't normally do, but nothing wrong with it. But during the invitational time as we're singing this last song, would you just go to them if they're here and say thank you? Thank you for being a blessing in my life as a Sunday school teacher, as a deacon, as a friend, as an elder member of this church. And I've just seen your example and your faithfulness. Would you go to them and just say thank you today? I think that'll make a world of difference. It'll encourage them, and you'll feel better having thanked them. Or maybe they're not here, and maybe you just want to come to the altar and say, Lord, thank you for bringing that person, my mom, my dad, my grandparents, into my life at a very important time. And Lord, they're with you, but I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. Let's stand together. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we just want to say thank you today. Thank you, Lord. I know that doesn't say it all, but that summarizes what's in our heart. Thank you for Jesus and your unspeakable gift. Lord, thank you for fellowship in the body of Christ. Thank you for the love of the brethren. Lord, thank you for sacrifices that people have made in all of our lives. And Lord, I most of all am grateful and thankful. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for caring for me. Thank you for providing for me. And Lord, last year at this time, we weren't sure exactly what was going to take place or how things would turn out. But Lord, you were there. And you guided and directed. And I just want to say thank you. In Jesus' name.